the area and is also um, here tonight to talk to us about uh, ways to feel your body for when we return to competition. So Dr. Rowe, thank you for joining us. I will turn it over thank to you. you. I know you have some presentation and then any questions. I that do. They have. Yeah, so it looks like we have a small group, which is great. We can um, make this a little bit more interactive. Um, just, you know, I like to, since we do have a smaller group for the, the students out there that um, obviously something drew you to come join us tonight. Um, if you wanna just say hi, where you're from or what school you're from, participating from and, um, you could do that in the chat and if there's anything specific around nutrition that you were specifically interested in that you'd like me to address this evening. Hi, I'm Elena. Hi, Elena. Um, I'm a junior this year at Sun Prairie High School and um, I came to just learn more about what I should be eating and how to get ready for the season. Perfect. What sport do you play, Elena? I play volleyball. Awesome. Great. And we have another Sun Prairie sophomore swimming. Perfect. Any others that want to share? Freshman at Sun Prairie. We got a lot of Sun Prairie. You did a nice job recruiting your athletes to join us tonight and volleyball too. And volleyball, another volleyball player. Okay, great. Well, you're in the right place. You know, unfortunately, we're kind of in this weird position of just kind of stagnant, right? And um, we're not in competition. And the thing is, we're someday we'll be back in our sport and we will be competing. And so now is the perfect time as we're kind of in this lull of um, our life to think about things that will impact our performance and sports performance, one being nutrition. So I'm hoping to maybe tonight plant a seed on things that you can do or learn about um, your nutrition. And, and let me try to share my screen with you so I can pull up my PowerPoint. Um, and how you can uh, fuel your body so that when you do return to competition, um, you can reap the benefits. All right. Excuse me while I'm, I'm not used to the Zoom platform. I'm usually on a different platform at UW. So you're in the right um, place. My name is Tara LaRoe. I am faculty at UW-Madison. I teach, um, uh, three different uh, nutri uh, sports nutrition courses to undergrads and graduate, um, as well as in the kinesiology department. So um, a little bit about me. Um, as you were told, I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. Um, I'm also a certified specialist in sports dietetics. So I have a um, board certified um, certification um, specifically uh, around sports. So I um, work with athletes and um, I think about sports and how nutrition impacts sports performance. So not only just a regular um, day in day out of what a registered dietitian does, but really how it relates to sports and performance. Um, I told you that I teach at UW, and I'm also a recreational athlete. So um, I participated in high school as a student athlete. Um, in college, I, I turned more to the recreational sports. So it's part of my life. Um, and as I'm talking, my, my two kids are getting ready for their hockey practice. So it's part of my family life as well. So today what I would like to do is really just go over what is nutrition and the differences between optimal nutrition and regular nutrition. Talk a little bit about some of those nuances. We hear these terms nutrition and good choices, poor choices, poor nutrition all the time, but really what does that mean? And then really hone in on the basics of optimal nutrition because that's kind of what we're striving for. Um, and then how to put that in practice, taking some of those basics of optimal nutrition and start practicing that in our daily life. Um, in hopes, of course, our goal is to improve sports performance. So here we have two pictures of two individuals and when you hear the word nutrition, what do you usually think? Anyone have any thoughts? 
everyone needs essential nutrients, right, for growth. I'm not looking at my, let's see. I'm, like I said, I'm not good with the chat function in these. So <laughs> they're, saying, anyway. they're saying energy, health. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we just need to sustain life. We need nutrients, right? I mean, we won't live to, um, for our heart to beat, for our eyes to see, um, for our muscles to move. We just need general nutrition, good nutrition. Um, optimal nutrition kind of meet, goes beyond that. So general nutrition is around growth and development, whereas optimal nutrition, it really means eating the right things at the right time and achieving performance in the longest lifetime and good health. So kind of achieving optimal um, potential of um, your food choices to bring about even better positive outcomes. And so here we can see the many impacts of optimal nutrition. Um, it decreases disease risk. So you think of long-term chronic disease. So I know many of you students, you don't think about that at such a young age. But when you start becoming my age, you start thinking about chronic disease. And if the better we eat now, our chances for chronic disease like heart disease and diabetes, it decreases our risk for those diseases that are really going to have significant impact um, as we age. Uh, decreasing fat mass, increasing lean mass, and also bringing about positive um, qualities around tissue quality, joint health, and growth and development. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see a lot of performance indicators. So you have the cognitive function. Um, our cognitive function improves with optimal nutrition. I'll talk about hydration in a moment, but when we're dehydrated and we're not getting enough hydration, our cognitive ability declines and our skill set declines. And so um, our muscles aren't going to be moving as fast and our reaction time isn't going to be as fast. And so having optimal nutrition means being adequately hydrated is going to give us that um, increased cognitive function, as well as exercise capacity, our energy endurance, and it reduces our risk for injury and will help you recover faster. So there's some fascinating work around injury and recovery related to nutrition and how you can use nutrition to support times of um, injury or recovery. And then I'm missing my last one because and sleep quality too, of course, is um, will improve with optimal nutrition. All right, so the goal here really is, you know, kind of the quintessential poor uh, foods over to the left here, um, you know, that really that aren't packed with a lot of nutrients. And kind of the goal here is to move less, um, to move more towards the right of the screen. So, you know, choosing less, less of those foods that really just supply calories and that's about it. Really not a lot of nutrients or good quality nutrients and choosing those foods that really will make a bigger impact as far as nutrient packed and good sources of protein and carbohydrates to really fuel our bodies and um, achieve optimal nutrition. So I'm sure as all of you athletes out there, you know, when you're in sport and you're in the mo mode of training for your sport, really, I would say all of you would probably, your number one goal would probably something around sports performance to perform your best, to get faster at something, to improve on something, to, um, you know, you name it. It's going to be around the performance of sports. Um, and if you talk with any, not only student athlete, but elite athlete, professional athlete, um, they're really, they're going to get this more global understanding of all the different things that go into that sports performance. So I think on a really simple level, um, youth athletics and other training programs, we work really hard on developing the strength and endurance 
for that sport specific, but there's really other, a lot of other factors that go into that will help with that sports performance. And so globally, we can think about our mental health and body composition as well as sleep quality, and one also being nutrition as being part of this whole sports performance package and things that work together synergistically to get us to where we want as far as performance goals. All right, so we're going to get into some basics of optimal nutrition. Now, forgive me if, you know, some of this is simple in nature, but really, I think, you know, getting down to the basics is really kind of what we all need to do um, to start to understand and have building blocks to get to, um, um, to make successful steps into getting to a goal. All right, so I would say the first basic um, basic uh, step to optimal nutrition is establishing an eating schedule. I mean, it sounds very basic, but there's so many individuals that kind of forget about eating or don't have any set pattern in place. And that can just derail a lot of performance. And when you're a structured athlete and you have practice at a certain time and games at a certain time, establishing a good eating schedule is going to ensure that you have enough calories and energy to get you through your training, to get you through your games. Um, so think about kind of what you eat during a day and when you eat. Chances are it might be that you're probably just not eating enough. There's so many athletes out there that are overtraining, not getting enough to eat to fuel their activity. So our bodies are growing and developing. We need a lot of energy and nutrients to just um, get our bodies through the daily processes of living and growing and developing, and then you throw on training and activity and other sports, you need to start feeling those activities as well. So establishing a good eating schedule will help ensure that you're meeting those calories and those energy requirements. And so um, everyone's different. Um, whatever you choose to do, my message would be to keep it consistent. So it could be that you're eating three square meals a day. Um, it could be that you're eating two large meals and building in a lot of um, snacks. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what those meals mean. So when I say a meal, and some of us do eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but think about, I know in my household and kind of my eating pattern, if you look at my dinner, it's pretty well-rounded. There's a good protein, maybe chicken or um, some kind of beef or what have you. Um, there's probably a starch, so a sweet potato or rice or um, grain of some sort, and then a vegetable. So it's pretty well-rounded. But when you think about breakfast, does your breakfast look like that? And most of the times, no. We're kind of running out the door. We're grabbing um, a granola bar or something. And so that's really not a meal. And so the goal is to kind of establish um, three, three um, meals that resemble um, a protein and a carbohydrate and all the all um, more food groups than just one. Okay, so keep it consistent. This is a way that we can ensure that you're getting enough calories and energy um, throughout the day. If your goal is to gain muscle, it's really important that you do not skip meals. Um, Fueling your muscles throughout the day is necessary. That's how your muscles are going to grow, is the constant fueling throughout the day. So skipping meals is not going to help with that goal at all. All right, so we talked about energy. Where are we getting our energy from? We're getting them from key nutrients, and it's the top three here, these macronutrients. So macro really just means we need these in large amounts, and you probably are very familiar with the macros, um, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. So these are our energy-yielding nutrients. They have very specific goals in our body. As far as sports performance, we need a lot of carbohydrates to get us through energy and perform sports. Our body kind of relies on, um, especially if you're a... Um, if you're, depending on type of sport, if you're a resistance sports 
uh, individual or stop and go, you're going to require a lot of uh, carbohydrates because we need immediate energy for short bursts of activity. And it's going to rely on carbohydrates. Um, protein is um, needed for uh, obviously muscle development and recruitment, but uh, the amino acids that make up protein are needed for so many functions throughout the body. So hormones and enzymes um, that are needed. And fat is essential too. It helps with joint health and absorption of vitamins um, and helps us um, thermoregulate. So it's kind of a protector and helps us regulate heat um, within our body. So below we have the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals. These are needed in small amounts. Um, now, sometimes it's a, there's a, some misnomer in, um, uh, out there, uh, I see this a lot, especially with energy drinks, that um, it has vitamin whatever and it's going to give you energy. Vitamins and minerals do not supply energy. Um, it's just the carbohydrates, protein, and fat that give energy. So vitamins and minerals, they're part of the pathway. They're needed um, for to convert carbohydrates and protein and fat into energy. So they're very essential for that purposes, but them themselves do not supply uh, energy. And so vitamins and minerals are found in all um, foods that we eat, and I'll show you in a moment. So these are very essential to keeping our immune system strong and healthy and protecting our body from disease. So what does this look like then with food selection? So we don't go to a restaurant and order carbohydrates or fat or protein, we eat foods and we kind of associate our eating with different types of food, but we can start building our eating schedule and meal plans based on our macronutrients. And if we're getting good sources of protein, kind of in the pictures you see here with the, the meats and the eggs and the beans and legumes, uh, carbohydrates, including grains, um, other starches, don't forget the potatoes, those are um, good starches and sources of carbohydrates, fruit and vegetables, as well as good sources of fat. If you're eating a combination of all these types of macronutrients to give you enough energy, chances are you're going to be meeting your mineral and vitamin requirements as well. So vitamins and minerals are found plentiful in all these different types of food. And again, if you're eating a combination of all these foods, you're gonna be getting adequate amounts of vitamins and minerals to make sure that the carbohydrates are being converted to energy, the protein is being built up into muscle tissue, and the fat is um, used again for um, regulating our um, body temperature, for cognitive function, um, and, and um, making essential hormones and absorbing uh, nutrients. All right, so one key nutrient I did not put on the previous slide and I should um, be ashamed of myself is water because water is an essential nutrient. Our body is predominantly made up of water. So it only makes sense that this is a nutrient that we should be, that should also be a priority within our con considerating, um, consideration of how we eat and choose food. Now. Foods, all foods contain some sort of wa water. We get foods from water, but then also drinking water and fluid obviously is a source, good sources of um, hydration. So hydration is needed, um, the, uh, needed for many um, functions. Temperature regulation, so what happens when we start to exercise and move around? Our body temperature increases, and how does that um, how do we then regulate that? We sweat, we cool ourselves down. And so water and circulation and hydration is all part of that process. And so making sure you're well hydrated as well as replenishing uh, fluids is going to keep you moving and temperature regulated and circulation. So dehydrated muscles is going to fatigue you early. Um, so there's some really interesting um, work on dehydration that has been done in basketball players. So I see a lot of volleyball players out there. So this would be very um, kind of um, 
uh, translatable to you, is just even a little bit dehydrated, 2% of your body weight dehydrated can really um, decrease skill set in, um, in your activity. So for example, um, they tested out um, the skills of shooting free throws with basketball players. And those that were a little bit dehydrated, um, their function in um, being successful at shooting free throws decreased. So you can imagine if you're in a long volleyball match and you haven't been drinking adequately and you're losing a lot of body fluids and you're a little bit dehydrated. And if you go into, I don't know, does volleyball go into overtime? Forgive me, I didn't play volleyball. But if you have a long match and it keeps going and going and going, which sometimes I think they can do, is that the team that's probably going to come out the winner is probably the team that probably was the best hydrated because they were able, their muscles were still moving, they were alert, they were able to, their skill set was still intact. So, you know, think about that when you're moving around and taking those breaks, when you're on the bench, taking the sips of water and making sure that you're um, going into a game, going into practice well hydrated as well as drinking throughout practice. So not only that we need water throughout the day, don't think of it, about it just drinking at meal times, but think about drinking all day long, especially when you start increasing workouts. So you're going to be needing to replace fluid that is lost. So again, you know, think about drinking water, other um, beverages, coffee, tea, and sweetened tea. Um, you know, I get taste fatigue a lot with just water. So any kind of flavoring agent, if you like putting lemons in your water, or they have a lot of those little, you know, flavoring agents that you can squirt in water, things that will help um, make uh, fluids a little bit more palatable, so and enjoyable that will want you to um, drink. So we get um, fluids from food too, as you can see here from oranges. Um, one fluid that I love, especially now that it's getting winter time, um, especially after um, sport, is soup. Um, it's it provides fluid. It has a little bit of sodium, so it kind of replaces some sodium that was lost in sweat. And sodium it um, helps you drink more water too, so it um, will help you um, kind of drive your thirst mechanism and and increase your thirst and drinking too. So um, now that it's winter, try some soup after your games or workouts. Okay, so putting this all into practice. And so, um, you know, many of you are probably a little bit disappointed that, you know, competition this season is not going to be what it was in previous seasons. But now is really kind of the time where you can start experimenting um, with setting a set schedule, um, developing a good eating pattern um, to your practice so that, um, so that when it comes time to competition, you're going to be adequately fueled and ready to go. Okay. So making it a plan. So as I said, that eating schedule is really important. So you can simply kind of think of a timeline and what you do during a day and start mapping things out if you wish. Um, but this is just one example of how an eating pattern, um, a fueling schedule might look. And now there's no activity planned in here, but it's kind of a typical school day. You wake up, have some breakfast, you have class, and then um, maybe there's a break and you have a snack. Lunchtime is one o'clock. By 4.30, you probably want another snack, and then dinner is later. And so if you break that down into each of those eating occasions, remember, we kind of want a lot, um, make sure that a meal is a meal, that it's providing enough energy that it has, you know, the protein and carbohydrate and fat. And so you can see here that our breakfast, we're going to have a protein and a grain and a fruit and a fat, and we can kind of build um, within each meal. And looking at the snack, it has at least two components, a protein and a fruit and a fat. Um, well, I guess they all have three components, but they all combine, you know, at least three components of our carbohydrate, protein, and fat. So again, we don't 
think of things often as I'm eating a protein or I'm eating a grain. We need to translate that into food choices. And so translating that, we can break it up into breakfast that would translate into the Greek yogurt being our protein choice, the granola being a, a carb or grain choice, blueberries, the fruit, and almonds are fat, and so on. Um, and so you can see here for the snack, the egg and orange. And so it's building off these, um, our macronutrient groups to get a well-rounded meal as well as enough energy to keep us going and sustain throughout the day. Now, of course, some of these foods might not be appealing to you. So again, it's to your preference and you build things how what foods you like. And oftentimes at a young age, we're still kind of acquiring some taste preferences and or we have very strong um, minds about what we like and what we don't like. Um, and so just shown below here, you know, on the left again is kind of a quintessential meal of fries and chicken tenders. Um, and compare that to the right. So it's kind of, you know, how can we upgrade what we're currently eating to make it a little bit more um, nutritious and bring in some of those uh, more nutrient packed foods. So, you know, on the right, you can kind of see a chicken tender, but it looks baked, it looks homemade. Um, and so maybe a little bit more nutritious and lean compared to a deep fried um, and, and the excess um, fat from the, the fried chicken on the left. You have some broccoli, so it's bringing some color to the plate. And I think there's some rice underneath, so a grain. So, you know, find ways where you can upgrade your meals. Um, any kind of um, movement to um, improving or upgrading a meal is, is success, it truly is. All right, snacks. Snacks are super important um, because like I said, you need a lot of energy, not only for your day-to-day -day functions, but then to get you through practicing and games and just the sustaining of energy throughout um, the day. And so snacks can be very important in um, helping you recover post um, exercise or game, but then, but also fueling you, yourself going into activities. So think outside the box and think about things that are portable that you can keep in your um, sports bag or your car. So on the way to or from practice, you have something readily available because oftentimes when you're um, after practice and you're busy on doing something else, you're going to a friend's house or you're uh, meeting up and doing something else and this can be forgotten. And so these are prime opportunities where we can keep ourselves fueled. And so if there's instant reminders of having things readily available to us in the locker room, in our bag, in the car, it, we're more likely then to grab it and eat it. So some ideas are listed here. Again, think outside the box, things that you like that are easy to make. Um, I, I just have some examples here. Um, the, the applesauce pouches, a lot of athletes love that. They put them in the refrigerator so they're nice and cold and those are great to grab and put into backpacks and whatnot. Um, hard boiled eggs are easy and portable, especially if a lot of you are doing virtual learning at home, easy to grab in between your classes when you're at home and easy to make too. The oatmeal packet. So there's so many things out there now that are very, make it very convenient for you to grab that are nutritious and um, easy for you to pre prepare and use on your own. Okay, so what is, again, fueling around training? Um, so as you start to increase your training, you're gonna need more fuel. You need to fuel your training. So really thinking about then the time periods before your training as well as after. So not only that you have your schedule that you made out before from the slide before, um, but maybe that 4.30 snack, it's going to be a little bit more than what you had previously because you know that you have practice at six o'clock. So maybe you throw in 
you know, extra, um, a little bit more trail mix or what have you. So it's a little bit more um, of sustenance that um, can keep you going into that 6 p.m. practice. And then having maybe a post-workout snack in your car. So it looks like you're having dinner at 6.30, 7.30, so really not a large amount of time between when you end a practice and when you eat a dinner. But if you get busy and things happen, having something almost immediately is really going to help your body stop that process of overworking and kind of breaking down and stopping that process and starting to the recovery process. So building up your muscle tissue and replacing all the energy that was stored in your muscles and re, um, replacing it um, through the process of um, having, grabbing something to eat and then going and having a really good dinner is going to um, help with that recovery process. So then you're going to be fully recovered, ready to go for the next day. All right, so as I said, you know, this is really your time. So it's a huge bummer for a lot of you that you're not um, able to participate in sport as you really wanted to. But take advantage of this time to think about other things that are um, indirectly or directly related to your performance. And really when it comes to nutrition, sometimes we have to make a lot of changes, big changes, um, and or even making small changes, but to experiment and think about things that you might want to change, just baby steps, this is a good time to do it. Um, when we're in the thick of competition and in season, we're focused on our sport and we're focused on, and on the competition and performance. So we're not really thinking about making uh, nutrition changes in our life. We're kind of just focused on that. So now's the time maybe to focus your attention on something that will complement your training when you get back into um, sports and competing. Um, so getting involved, getting engaged. So if, if there's skills that you think you need as far as um, cooking skills or um, working with your family with developing meal plans, um, making a grocery list if mom or dad does a grocery shopping, um, adding to that, being involved and engaged in that way so that you know, you're um, becoming very independent and being able to choose some of your food choices, yet um, often we still live in an environment where um, mom or dad or our family also controls um, the food environment in our household, but um, you have a say and you can be in involved and engaged in that process. And all of this will help you become prepared. So when competition does resume, you'll be well prepared for meeting your performance goals. I always kind of want to put a plug in for the registered dietitian because many people don't really know all the services uh, this type of healthcare provider can provide. Um, and so really when to seek advice from registered dietitian nutritionists, um, such as myself. Uh, if you have a specific nutrition goal in mind, um, if you're thinking about using a supplement, we have a lot of um, support staff around us, coaches and friends and athletic trainers, and they know a great deal about nutrition, but sometimes it's out of their scope of practice. They're really focused on what they were trained to do. And so all of this is within a scope of practice for the registered dietitian. So if you're thinking about using a supplement, dietitians can help you determine, you know, um, reasonings on pros and cons on whether this is a good idea or not. If you want an individualized eating plan or nutrition plan, something individual to you, because we're all very different and um, indiv um, unique individuals that um, are going to respond differently to different um, eating patterns, and we have different preferences. So, you know, this whole talk is really was a lot of generalization, and it might not be um, specific. Some of those these aspects that I talked about isn't going to be specific to you or not going to specifically meet your needs. So being, becoming more um, individualized and specific to you, um, a dietitian can help with that. If you have a specific health condition, uh, type 1 diabetes, if you have food allergies, these are all things that um, a registered 
registered dietitian can help you navigate through and make good food selections so you're not um, inadvertently skipping out a big um, food group and not meeting certain nutrients in your diet, for example. If you have a restrictive diet, if you practice a vegetarian diet, or if you're gluten-free, these are diets that are um, essentially excluding some food groups. And so if you're excluding these food groups, we need to think about other ways to, for example, getting iron and good protein sources if you're uh, eating a vegetarian um, a diet. Um, I like to remind everyone, I am not the food police. We are not the food police. Um, we're, help you, we're here to help you succeed. Um, and, you know, no diet is perfect. I think everyone is always on the road to improvement and wants to think about ways they can improve so that they can meet their goals, whether they be their um, sport related or not. And so I'll end with one of my favorite moments and hockey history. Um, but any questions from anyone in the audience? So there's one on here, Tara, I'll read it. Okay, sure. Does salt dehydrate you or just make you thirsty? Um, so salt, salt will help with um, a few mechanisms. It, um, it won't necessarily dehydrate you. It will actually increase your thirst mechanism. So eating a little bit of salt will actually improve um, the drive to drink. So um, now it depends on, as far as salt goes in our day-to-day -day diet, um, we probably get enough sodium from our diet, just eating day-to-day -day outside our activity. Um, in relation to sports and performance, where sodium can be necessary is when you're losing a lot of fluid during performance or activity and you need to replace fluid. So when you're losing sweat, you're losing sodium. Um, and so replacing it with a little bit of sports drink that has sodium, it's going to not only replace the sodium, but it's also going to stimulate your drive to drink and so increase your fluid intake. Another question is, what is the most important component of recovery nutrition following a competition, both for all day invitationals and following later evening games? And I was going to ask something about invitationals too, like a volleyball invite or a wrestling invite. Like what should these kids be fueling their bodies with? You know? Yeah, good, good question. So all day competition. So the key is to kind of, um, have really good portable snacks with you almost all day long. So if you have kind of back-to-back -back competitions, having snacks that your stomach can tolerate well that you can break down for quick energy. So they're going to be more carbohydrate-based. Um, so you're thinking, you know, kind of like the granola bars and the crackers. Um, and you can put like a little bit of peanut butter just for a taste quality on them. Um, you know, the, the fruit leathers or fruit snacks, things that are easily digestible that can give you some sustained and quick energy. Um, you know, for the invitationals, if you have um, recovery right after and then going into the next day, certainly you're going to want a well-rounded meal. So having carbohydrates and protein. So when you have a lot of these games back to back to back, it's probably going to be a little bit more carbohydrate heavy just because of all the energy requirements that you need, but adding in um, little amounts of protein, especially after. So everyone always kind of gets the chocolate milk message, right? The, um, but it supplies, you know, chocolate milk is kind of one of those things that has fluid in it, so it's replacing fluid loss. It has the carbohydrates from the chocolate, so that's um, replacing um, uh uh, glycogen stores or carbohydrate stores in your muscle, and it's also giving you some protein. So it's stopping that um, process of breaking down protein and building it back up. So especially important for the next day recovery and fluid, drinking lots of fluid and water. Uh, back to another question about salt. Mm -hmm. um, is too much salt bad for you? And how much is too much? Yeah. So salt is one of those really interesting things. So 
I probably guarantee that everyone on this call were probably eating too much sodium because that's just how our food environment is. So sodium, the recommended amount of sodium is 23, the upper limit. Um, we, we need about 1,500 milligrams, so 1 1.5 grams of salt. That's not a whole lot when the average person is probably eating about 3,000 to 4,000 milligrams per day. So I guarantee all of us are probably getting plenty, if not more sodium than we need in our diet. Again, so I don't, I don't think that's going, when we're choosing kind of good um, uh, foods from um, different sources and we're, when we're preparing foods ourselves, we can control a lot of that sodium. So a lot of our sodium that's coming in our food are from the packaged foods, the dining out, going to restaurants. So that's kind of where we get a lot of our sodium. And so I don't know, maybe some of that has um, lessened a bit now because of the pandemic, we're not eating out as much, or maybe we are, maybe we're doing more carry out. I don't know. Um, but that's where we get a lot of our sodium is and um, so kind of blanket statement I think a lot of us are getting probably too much sodium as it is um, as far as again with the sports performance sodium is very necessary in our body it, it regulates our blood pressure um, when we lose sweat, we lose sodium. And so, and oftentimes if an athlete, and this more is for uh, specific sports and specific conditions where we're losing a lot of fluid, um, body fluid in certain uh, temperatures, um, certain elements, and we're just replacing it with water, we're almost kind of diluting our sodium in our water in our body. So we can actually become very, it can be a dangerous situation when we have too low body sodium levels. Um, so that's when sodium, replacing it, sodium is necessary. Do you have another? Yeah. Um, are there standard foods that the average teen athlete should be eating on a daily basis? Um, are those standard foods? Um, yes, yeah, so all those, if we go back to um, some of those slides, it's really going to be, um, again, meeting your energy needs, eating throughout the day, getting in good sources of carbohydrates coming from fruits, vegetables, grains, good protein sources, including dairy um, and um, and lean meats, and then good sources of fat. So it's kind of those thinking of those macro nutrients, and then translating it to different food choices. So again, we're all very different in what we prefer and what we like. Um, and so I would say the standard foods are going to be your protein sources, your carbohydrate, and your, your fat. It's being very broad, I know. Um, but an average teen needs all these foods because if we're getting these broad range of foods, we're getting all the necessary vitamins and minerals because you're still growing and developing. Um, oh, good one. Um, now I'm seeing the, is caffeine okay or does it hurt performance or training? Good question. So a lot of research in caffeine now. Um, so caffeine is one of those, they call it an ergogenic supplement. Ergogenic meaning it enhances performance at some um, level. And it's actually been um, rather confirmed that it, it can help support um, performance and training. So a couple different mechanisms. So one, it keeps you more alert. Your perceived um, exertion might be lessened of having caffeine. Now, there's this whole other opposite end is there too much. And especially for teenagers, is there too much caffeine? Having one cup of coffee, which is about 100 milligrams of caffeine, might be okay. Um, those... Um, what are they called, like Bolt and all those monster drinks, they have lots of caffeine that's not disclosed many times on the label, as well as all these other um, uh, um, ingredients that are in there that can interact with caffeine and cause potential adverse effects. So getting caffeine from a more natural source, such as a, a caffeinated beverage like coffee or tea, is a lot better than a caffeine source from those jolt 
drinks, monster drinks, what have you. Um, also, the research genetics, your genetics play a role in this. So sometimes, you know, you probably know who you are. If you can drink coffee all day and go to bed, you know, just fine at night, you probably, caffeine probably doesn't do much for um, your performance needs. Your body probably doesn't process it um, like other people where if you drink coffee and you get this jolt, you are affected differently by caffeine. So we have different genetics and depending on what genes we have, we process caffeine differently. So for the growing teenager, I just say be careful with caffeine. Stay away from those. Um, not, you know, the, the Gatorade drinks are fine because they don't have caffeine, but it's all those other drinks that are marketed for sports performance that really um, don't do anything as far as, um, if anything, they'll hurt your performance. Um, okay, Sean as sugar, does it affect us? a lot while performing and how much should we be having or is it fine to have it? Yeah, that's a good question. So remember, carbohydrates, you break them down, it's a sugar, right? So sugar is sugar. So as far as um, during performance, our body doesn't care if you're getting the energy from a candy bar or from um, an apple. And so, of course, the candy bar is a more nutrient-poor source of carbohydrates versus um, the apple. And when performing, our body just wants easily digested sugar. And so eating easily digested sugar is, I think, is okay. Um, the fruit snacks, the orange slices, um, crackers, uh, things that are easily digested that can convert to sh um, sugar molecules to get energy into you quickly. So when you look at a sports drink, for example, it has simple carbohydrates, it has simple sugar, and it's made form it's, it's specifically formulated so it can be digested quickly and give us, um, you know, quick energy. Um, outside of performance, um, is it fine to have it? So again, thinking about quality carbohydrates then outside. So again, staying away from the candy, nutrient, you know, things that don't supply a lot of nutrients. You want things that are supplying good nutrients. Um, so the grains and vegetables and fruits and starches like potatoes, those are going to be giving you nutrients that are needed for energy and growth and development. And I think, um, you know, as far as going back to the sugar question, a lot of it comes with how well we tolerate foods. Um, so, you know, you're thinking about um, sometimes events are very short. And so do you need it during performance? Maybe sometimes you don't have to have any kind of supplementation during your sporting event. Uh, maybe it's just after. Um, if it's a long um, um, you know, I always think of like marathon runs or long distance running. There might be a time where you're, you're going to need to supplement a little bit. And so again, that kind of goes back to the principle of your body doesn't really care where that source is coming from. Sometimes you have to um, just know what your body is going to tolerate, what um, it seems good to you. You know, are you going to be able to tolerate a, a chocolate whatever or is it better to have something a little bit more dry, like a cracker that's going to help you um, tolerate and um, is with your performance levels? Any other questions? Yeah, Tara, is there any tips you have to mm -hmm. do this on a, if you want to say budget friendly? Yeah. Uh, you know, I obviously all across the board on that, but anything we can do, because it sometimes seems like the healthier you eat, the more expensive it is. Um, yeah, tr yeah, right, right. So, and again, I think that's kind of a misnomer is that we can eat really healthy on a budget. So, you know, thinking now as we're going into 
the winter season. So, um, you know, I hear a lot, well, fresh fruits and vegetables are the best. Um, well, a lot of them aren't in season now. And so if you are buying fresh fruits and vegetables, they are going to be more expensive. Frozen fruits and vegetables are awesome. And they are packed with nutrients. They're picked at ripe peak times, so they still have the nutrients in them. So getting fruits, um, frozen fruits and vegetables on hand, those are great for you know throwing into smoothies and blending up with all of that. And you know they stay. Um, you can keep them frozen for a long time, so they don't. You know you you can use them at your leisure versus the fresh fruits and vegetables. You have to you know they have a expired amount of time to use them in. So that's one tip: um, frozen fruits and vegetables, canned beans, um, or even um, uh, um, just making your own beans and lentils in packets. But so many things are canned. You can just rinse off the. Um, you can choose the low sodium option. Rinse off um, the juice that they're in. The um, applesauce pouches, they're pretty inexpensive. Eggs are super inexpensive and it's a great source of protein and easy. Um, you can hard boil, I mean, that was the first thing I taught my kids how to do is make eggs. So you can scramble them, you can hard boil them, you can put them in any kind of meal. You can, you know, they're great for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, so great um, option for snacks and meals. Um, I'm probably thinking so yeah um, frozen is good um, there's some canned things like the the canned beans oh I love the tuna packets tuna canned tuna inexpensive good source of protein I love those packets of tuna those are great portable snacks that you can throw in backpacks um, in your sports bags um, what have you so those are good options too there's so many things now if you just kind of take time and explore at um, stores and grocery stores of all these like convenience items that are um, that can be fairly inexpensive and on a budget and I know a lot of this I think we were talking about this um, before Eric that um, a lot of the schools now because of the pandemic they are um, the USDA that runs the food programs the school food programs um, me, school meals are free to all students. It doesn't matter um, income eligibility. Any student can um, stop by a site and pick up um, school meals. And so, you know, think of that as an option too, because these are uh, meals that are prepared that have to that are um, meet different nutrition standards. So they are adequate in the amount of protein and carbohydrates and nutrients to meet your energy requirements for a lunch meal, for example. So um, these are options that are available to students right now. And so I would encourage, that's a, that's a budget friendly option that we all have the opportunity to tap into during this time. Where does corn rate? So corn is, I think you probably mean as like a starch. Yeah, so corn, corn's a starch. Um, and, you know, I think all, all these, um, you know, no food should be off limits. You know, we all have our preferences and they can all be part of our diet. Um, so corn is a starch, so I, um, you know, you know, if you're using corn as a replacement for vegetable, um, you know, rethink that. Um, so the corn is going to be, you know, blend in a vegetable with your corn. Um, but it supplies a lot of good nutrients. Um, I like corn. Make it part of your meal if you like it. <laughs> Any last questions from any of our athletes on here? I don't want to step on anybody's toes here if you have any last ones. Mm -hmm. um, but I know somebody's put in the message too. A lot of great info, a lot of great insight. Um, you know, Tara, we appreciate it a ton for you popping on tonight with us. Sure. With athletic directors in with the uh, athletes to share some of this info. Um, and yeah, it was like, a, like Jeremy said, lots of great info and a lot of great insights. So I appreciate it a ton. Thank great. you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for the good questions. Thanks, everyone. Good luck to you all.
Thank you. And thanks to the <laughs> athletes that jumped on tonight as well. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome.